chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. I feel a little out of sorts because I just wasn't, I wasn't here last week. And I hope you enjoyed Evangelist Dustin Duke as he preached. Yeah, he has just been a real blessing in our ministry and uh, really had some great results in Miami Beach from all the outreach that they did there and really looking forward to uh, the Lord uh, sending them uh, back with us again. I told him, I said, Brother Duke, we just probably need to hire you to do full-time what you did uh, while you were here. And uh, he said, well, you know, make me an offer. And I said, well, what, tell me what you want and I'll offer it. And uh, I'd love to have I'd love to have the Duke family here. Boy, they were a real blessing. Man, we've reached a lot of people in Miami Beach. He's a hard worker and uh, just has a good overview of the ministry and love for people and what a blessing that they were. Uh, we were greatly blessed this last week being part of a church planning conference out in, in Washington, in Squam, Washington, actually at Cornerstone Baptist Temple. Pastor Savage out there has been responsible for planting quite a few different churches, Cornerstone Baptist being the first, and then uh, a number of different churches just in little towns around their area. They're praying about planting another one. And, and uh, so uh, they, for kind of their revival, they, they have a church planting conference every year. And I was privileged to be able to go to that, be one of the speakers and so forth. And really had a marvelous time. Also met with a lot of folks. Uh, there are the preachers and a, a pastor in uh, Tacoma, Washington, wants to do a bunch of uh, special tracks and things for us. And so we've got some real neat prospects. Uh, and uh, they're, they're willing to get us as many Bibles, uh, New Testaments, as we'll pass out in uh, Miami and so forth. So we've got some neat projects that are going to be coming up as a result of some of the things that happened this last week. And so uh, you asked me about that, and I'll be glad to share that with you personally. But it was a, it was a good time for me. And it was, uh, Melissa and I really enjoyed just getting a week away and getting to sit under preaching all day. And, and uh, we had a marvelous time. So thank you for the folks that stepped in and covered for us while we were gone. And I know that when you're gone, things are never the same. And so when I'm gone, I'm sure things aren't the same either. And I appreciate your being patient with that as well and understanding. Uh, we try we try not to be gone very much. I think this last year we missed three, three Sundays this year. And I feel like three is too many, but sometimes it's necessary. And so here we are in Revelation. Revelation. And uh, I would like to just begin reading in the first several verses. And uh, I actually want to read to verse 5, and we'll, we will do a little bit of review to come to where we're at in our text to set our context this morning. But I'm going to answer a question. Uh, actually, the, the text here answers a question that every Christian really has. And uh, the, really the question is, is God right to judge? Is God fair to judge or to destroy the wicked? We're going to see in our context here today God doing terrible things to the wicked. And we're going to look at whether or not that's right for God to do that. Now, lest you uh, think that I'm standing in judgment of God, I'm not this morning. A lot of people struggle with the answer to the question, how can God be good and destroy the wicked? And a lot of people struggle with the answer to that question. We see it actually in our context here today. We're going to see two major uh, reasons and two major answers, and then we'll see uh, maybe so, some that supported it. So if you would this morning, if you want a title for the message, we'll call it The Case Against God. The Case Against God. Look in verse 1 of chapter 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. And so we'll pray. Father, please help us this morning to see why it is you're righteous because you've judged thus. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, where we're at in Revelation is that we're at the end of the uh, third woe. You say the third woe. Well, if you haven't been uh, following along or studying with us, 
I'd like to give you a brief outline of Revelation. I cannot do this every week because it just takes uh, too much time. But I want us to have an understanding of what these events are. We are in the portion of Revelation which is uh, referring to future events. That is, things that have not yet taken place, but will take place literally as described in the Scripture here in Revelation. We're in this study in response to, first of all, our desire to know the Word of God, but secondly, in response to the promise of God's blessing for every person who reads, hears, and does the things that are written in this book. In other words, God promises that individuals who read, study, and do the things that are in Revelation are going to have His blessing. How many of you desire God's blessing in your life? I mean, listen, if this book is true, and it is, it promises. It promises that if you will read it and hear it and do it, then you are going to have God's blessing in your life. And so that's our motivation behind our series, if you will. And we're not just bored and we don't know what to preach. Uh, it's not just the next thing that came up. But we desire God's blessing. And uh, we saw the outline of Revelation in chapter 1, verse 19. When John was told, write the things which were, that's past, and the things which are, that's present, and the things which shall be hereafter, and that's future. And so the outline of Revelation, just like every good letter, uh, tells you what it's going to tell you uh, before it's stated, just like... Uh, every good letter is written, this letter is written in the same way. In other words, in the introduction, uh, John explains the scenario in which he was given the prophecy of the revelation, and he describes the, the uh, past events. In other words, he was in the Isle of Patmos, and he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Those were the events surrounding him. And he describes the present events uh, when, after he's told to write those things, then immediately uh, he's given the letters to the seven churches of Asia, and those take us up to chapter 4 of Revelation, if you want to understand an overview or an outline of how Revelation is laid out. So the church age is the age in which we presently live. That's present tense. Then after that, we see a series of after this sort of statements beginning in chapter 4. Also in chapter 4, we never again see the church. We never see the church again referenced. We see God working through Israel, working through the temple, uh, working through, uh, we see God working to judge the wicked, but we do not see God working through the church. The church is never mentioned again in Revelation after chapter 4. And that's because the church is going to be taken up. The church is the present day, the present age. And the events which come hereafter are going to be events that if you're part of the church, that is, you're born again, you're not going to be here for, but you will uh, be an eyewitness with God. You'll be part of that host uh, from heaven. And so then we see that judgment begins. Judgment begins in the period that is, we call it the tribulation period, but it's just a period of three and a half years and three and a half years. In other words, three and a half years of catastrophic events and then three and a half years of really catastrophic events. And those events are God's judgment. Chapter 10 takes us to the midpoint of the tribulation period. In the tribulation period, we see John is, um, is, is sees in heaven. He sees a book, and it is sealed. And it's open, and there are seven seals by the Lamb of God. And in the seven seals, there are seven judgments. The last of the seal judgment is a series of seven trumpets. And those trumpets are trumpet judgments. The last of the three trumpet judgments are three woes. Woe, woe, woe. And as, as the seals begin, things get hard. As they continue with the trumpets, things get worse. By the time we get into the woe judgments, things are terrible. And the last of the woes, of course, are seven angels. If you look in our, where we're at in our text today, uh, we're, going, we're, we're actually in that last of the three woes. And I'd like to look at verse 7 and 8 of chapter 15, if you will, to bring us into our text. And then I just want to preach a message, kind of a standalone message, if you will. We can come to Revelation and look at this, this passage, chapter 16, and we could preach it by itself because of the teaching that we're going to see here today. In other words, it, uh, it has application that is for us today. It's, it shows us the character and the person of God. Let's look at verse 7 and 8 of chapter 15, and then I'll explain that statement. One of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. 
Notice this. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now imagine this, if you will. Uh, where is the temple of God that's being alluded to here? Jerusalem. In this situation, this temple's in Jerusalem? Not yet, right? We're still in the tribulation period. So, we're still in tribulation period. Where is the temple of God? Where it is now. It's in heaven. It's where God is. God's throne. Let me ask you a question. Do, do, does anyone have access to the temple of God today? Come on, it's not, it's not a trick question. What? Yes. yes, we just went there a minute ago, didn't we? In other words, through prayer, we're able to go boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy. So we just went there. We have access right now to the temple of God. Does it shed any light on the gravity of the situation when no man is able to enter into the temple of God after the blood has already been offered on the throne of God? Is this, is this an impressive scene that we see described in the temple room, the throne room of God in heaven? I'm impressed by it, aren't you? And I look at this and I think, okay, we're able to have bold access to the throne of God. His, his wrath toward us has been satisfied by the substitution, by the blood of Jesus Christ, who Himself offered His own blood. Remember this? It's in Hebrews. And He sat down. But there's a moment in heaven before these, this final woe judgment where they clear the throne room. Everybody out. God's full wrath is about to be poured out. Uh, you ever seen the bumper sticker, Jesus is coming, and boy, is He mad? I haven't seen that in a long time. It's kind of cute. It's probably not really actually funny. It's probably a little bit uh, uh, blasphemous, I suppose. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that no man is in the presence, no one, none of the angels, no one's in the presence of God here. I don't think that's ever been a scenario that's ever uh, taken place according to chapter 15. That just impresses me and it gives me a little bit of an idea of where God is at. Now, I don't know how many of y'all grew up in spanking homes, but I did. And uh, I grew up in... And my parents didn't have Dr. John Rice's book on, uh, on how to discipline your children. And they didn't have Dr. Bill's book on how to discipline children. They just heard angry old preachers talk about beating the children, you know. And uh, I, I wish, uh, my parents know this today, but I wish they knew you don't, you don't paddle your children when you're angry. You know, you don't spank your children when you're angry. My mom used to punctuate her swats. I call them swats, they really weren't. <laughs> she used to punctuate the blows with whatever the weapon was she was spanking us with. And uh, some people call them paddles, but they sometimes were not paddles. <laughs> and uh, she used to say, like, don't. You have, like, but she would shriek them, you know, shrilly. I, I, I don't have the voice for it this morning. But uh, I mean, just like, you know, full blown. Uh, anyway, we, you know, she, she was pretty smart. She'd take you and she'd put you down on a chair and put your head under the table. And then when you come up, you know, you hit your head while you're <laughs> spanked, you know, the whole thing. Anyway, I grew up in a spanking home. And I want to tell you something. Uh, we as kids used to pray that dad would be the one to spank us. Because normally, uh, normally he'd come home from work and mom would tell him what we'd done, you know, and he'd be in a lot of trouble if he didn't do something about us. And so it was sort of like, you better spank these kids or I'm going to spank you. I'm kidding just a little bit here. But the fact is my dad was usually pretty half-hearted in his spanking. He administered discipline because it was his duty, but he, it was not very heartfelt most of the time. Very rarely. I don't think my dad ever gave me a spank in that. Um, really, you know, well, it just wasn't anything like mom's spank. That's all this. <laughs> mom could paddle a lot harder. Uh, I always wanted dad to be the one that paddled me, not mom. And if mom paddled, I wanted her to be having a good day. <laughs> I, you, there were just some days you're like, there's going to be a lot of spankings today and it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what, what I do. It's just, you know, she's going to check our rooms and they're not going to be clean enough. She's going to go in the garage and it's not going to be right. So they're just, you know, Daniel and Jennifer, I always made good grades because I was fearful not to. 
but Daniel or Jennifer are going to get a bad grade on a test or something, and fur is going to fly. That's just the way it's going to be today. And it was just a scary day. Now, my friend, the fact of the matter is, is that all you and I know about God, honestly, is His hand of mercy, His even when He chastises His unwillingness to destroy us. That's all we know about God is that when He chastises us, it's because we're His children and, we're in, and it is because He loves us and He wants what's best for us. So even when God chastises us, it's done so with such a reserved... I mean, sometimes things can be... To get our attention, we need some things to get pretty rough, don't they? Mm -hmm. And I've prayed with many a parent who has wayward children... And I've just prayed, you know, I've heard parents just cry and say, God, whatever it takes to get their attention. I understand that. And, and my prayer is, God, help them, you know, you know, get their brain, you know. And I, and I want to go to them and just say, think of this. If you'll respond to God's gentle hand, you won't have to have His hard hand. Amen. But, God's, but God's God. And His children are His children, and, and His enemies are His enemies. And if He's a right and just judge, my friend, He will do justice. I don't think that any, any normal parent delights in judgment. Don't your parents just wish your kids were perfect? And that you could just meet out rewards all the time instead of judgments? Like, you know what, I've noticed you have been excellent for a year. You know, like this has been a great year. I can't even think the last time you did anything to displease me, we're going on a trip. We're going to, I'm going to buy you this. Every parent wants to buy their kids like the latest, uh, the latest, not, not Apple products because kids don't like those, but the latest like Microsoft uh, computer and the latest whatever things that kids like, you know, I don't know what kids like. The, you know, the latest in clothes and whatever, whatever. I'm being a little silly about that. The reality of it is that, honestly, if parents could just give their kids gifts all the time, they delight to do that much more than judgment. Every parent does. But it's not good for them. We, we know what it's called spoiling. And uh, God doesn't want to spoil us, and, and uh, parents don't want to spoil their children. But the way you and I know God is nothing like what we see in Revelation chapter 15. We see God saying, clear the... Clear the throne room. Everybody out. And smoke filling the temple. And God's wrath is about to pour out. When those angels said, whoa, 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 this third woe is, oh, this is terrible. It's terrible judgment. And so I want to ask the question, is God right? I, there's no question here. Could we say that God is angry here? Could we say God is furious here? Yes. Could we use any word to describe wrath and have it not be an understatement here with regard to what we see God described as? Would that be fair to say? We could say God's wrath is... I mean, it is, He is just furious. And in chapter 16 of verse 1, I heard a great voice in the temple saying to the seven angels, a voice out of the temple. Whose voice would this be? Who has the right to command the angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth? Yeah. Well, I think it's probably God's voice. In verse 2, the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped the image. Now we know that there are the 144,000 that have the mark of God on them, and God has taken them to a safe place in the wilderness. He's protecting them so they can't be destroyed. We know that there are those that, uh, that are the witnesses and that respond to the message of the witnesses. But we know here that these individuals uh, are individuals who have taken the mark of the beast. We, we're introduced to the beast and the dragon who is the devil. And so these are individuals that are literally devil worshippers, Satan worshippers. And the Bible says they had a noisome and grievous sore upon the men. I don't know what a noisome sore is. I could imagine what a grievous sore could be, but this would be abject misery. I want to go right to the second, to, to the second angel in verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. Now again, the, the description in 
the, in our text today is not accidental. In other words, the blood it became as the blood of a dead man isn't something that occurred um, that that occurred you know just haphazardly or was just included or written that way. No, it's literally this. The, the it became as the blood of a dead man. And I don't really have a good description. I just can imagine that it would be a putrid, stinking blood. It would be filthy. And the Bible says that it, it, it was poured out on the sea. In verse 4, see the third angel. He poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. So you got a bubbling brook or a stream. You ever see a spring coming out of the ground? A couple of years ago, Melissa and I were driving along, uh, I think it was Lake Superior, along the coast of Lake Superior, uh, on the shores of Wisconsin, kind of going up into the Upper Peninsula. And there was this little place, I have pictures of it, and I think I may have a video of it. There's a little place where there's just this little, look like an outhouse building on the side of the lake. And there's a little park that you pulled in. And so I pulled in to see what it was all about because people were pulling off the highway and pulling in there. And there was this pipe coming out of the ground where it was just like an artesian well where fresh water was coming out. And uh, we filled up our water. Man, it's some of the best water I've ever tasted. Just coming out of the ground, and they put a pipe in the ground, and, and people were pulling up with just their water bottles and their jugs, and they were they were all filling their water in this natural uh, spring that was coming up out of the ground. And there, you know, uh, I've seen some springs like that on our farm in Kansas. At one of my grandpa's pastures, there was a spring coming out of the side of a hill, and he always wanted to. He had a well. He always wanted to uh, tap into the spring because it had really really good water. And so we actually did, uh, when I was a teenager, ran pipe over and just uh, made an overflow tank and, uh, and uh, put a pipe right into the ground where the spring was coming out and ran it into the basement, the house across the road. What was interesting is that it gravity fed into the basement. And so we actually had a spring coming into the basement of the house. That was a little bit of a problem until we got it stopped up. <laughs> and uh, then we put the well pump in the basement to give it pressure. When I was in high school, I did a a project where I tested water and it tested as some of the most pure water. I tested against all the different purified water, the city water, the city uh, water company let me come in and we did a bunch of tests and things. We tested rain and snow and, and different things and it was the best, it tested the best of any of the water. It was a really great spring. And uh, around our farm you could be wandering around and you'd find some springs like that either down at the river, running into the river or uh, by some of our ponds or whatever. And I always used to enjoy as a kid just going, man, the water's always cold and clear out of spring. Probably full of bacteria and stuff too, but I survived it. And, uh, but it uh, tasted wonderful. And I just can't imagine those springs being turned into blood like the blood of dead men. It's fresh. I mean, are you, I'm talking about these springs right now. Aren't you getting this feeling of, oh, I just want to drink some fresh water right now? Yeah, that's the way I feel talking about it. I want to go out and drink some fresh spring water. This is putrid, like blood. Turn into blood, blood of dead men. Well, that sounds terrible. And here we see the first response, the angels, and their defense, if you will. If you could imagine this accusation, which the text appears to you know, lay out there, like God is terrible. God has destroyed the waters of the earth, and that's terrible. In verse 5, John said, And I heard the angel of the waters say, the angel of the waters, that is the one that's responsible for this, and seems like the one that's responsible for the purity of the waters. He, this is his task to overlook the waters. This is something that's personal to him. And he said, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be. So you are, you were, and you will be. So God is past, present, future. Because thou hast judged this. And here is the argument that the angel lays out. Verse 6, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. God, you're right to do this, and the reason you're right to do it is because they love blood. They're bloodthirsty. And so you've given them what they wanted. Blood. You say, Pastor, that's probably not how they wanted it. You know, when individuals want wicked things and they want excesses, they generally don't want the, the, the whole thing that comes with it, do they? People that commit sins don't usually want the consequences for sins. 
I haven't heard a sermon on it in a long time, but I think it's for fine and appropriate to preach uh, about sin and preach about the kind of things that happen when you sin. I remember back in the 1980s and 1990s, preachers preaching about AIDS, HIV, and they talked about the curse of AIDS. You say, Pastor, there are innocent people that have HIV. I'm fully aware of that, uh, but there aren't many. There aren't many. I know some individuals who didn't do anything wrong and they had and they contracted HIV. But I know of individuals that lived wicked lifestyles and they got HIV. And other things that come along with it. And uh, you say, Pastor, that's just terrible you to say. You know, it's kind of terrible to say that God's right uh, to turn water into blood for people that love the blood of men. No, actually it's not. It's just the truth. And sometimes the truth is kind of in your face. Sometimes truth seems kind of awful, doesn't it? It seems unrelenting. It seems unbending. I just want to remind you that it is true that God is a God of wrath. Listen, you want to play the God is only love and God you know, has no reason to destroy anything, then my friend, you've forgotten about what happened to Jesus when He died on the cross. Was that a lovely sight? Was it a lovely scene? My friend, I could not, I could not gaze on Christ on the cross. I'll be honest with you, I cannot stomach a passion play. I can't stomach a passion play because I just, I just, just to see something that depicts Christ on the cross, it's just too terrible for me. It's too awful. It's too horrible. Jesus was God's sinless Son. He never died. He never did anything to deserve to not only die, but to become the sins of those that He died for. My friend, sin's a terrible thing. And God's wrath is terrible. And God's wrath is real. And God turned His wrath on His Son instead of on me so that He could be merciful to sinners. Oh, you don't, don't talk about God. He's just love. Oh, my friend, what Jesus saw that day when He said, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? He didn't see God's love. He saw God's back. He saw God's wrath. And sometimes it's good for us to be reminded that God wants to be merciful. So much so that He gave His Son for us. Oh, what a verse of love. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. My friend, God is indeed love. But God is more complex than just a silly, simple, loving God. He's a just God. There are individuals that do not love God in spite of His love for them. Is that not so? See, the reality of it is that I have a hard time understanding some of the responses of individuals who will not bow before God as we see in our context today. You know why? Because when I understood God's love, and I understood the fact that I should have been God's enemy and be, ought to be judged for my sin, I bowed to God. And I received Jesus as my Savior. And that was my response. So I cannot relate to a person who is so proud that they say, I'll never bow to you, God. My friend, who do you think you are? Listen, God is eternal. We're mortal. God is a Creator. We're created. And the audacity of any created being saying, it's not right for me to bow to you. I'll never do it. My friend, they're wrong. And here are individuals whose response to God's wrath is blasphemy. Let's look at it further. The angel that uh, over the water said, Thou, you know, God, you're, you're right. You're righteous. Uh, they're wrong. They shed the blood of saints and prophets. And our first point we see today, if you haven't picked it up and gathered it uh, from the inference, is that God is just, man is unjust. In other words, the argument against God, God, this is too terrible. God, you're wrong to judge. God, for you to destroy the wicked makes you evil. No, no, God destroys evil. The wicked who God is judging, they're the ones who is evil. God is righteous. Do you see that today? God's right. We look at this, the wrath of God and we see here God is wholly justified in His wrath. 
There's no one good. There's nothing good God is directing His wrath toward. In verse 7, I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are Thy judgments. And there's a witness in heaven that says, Even so. That's exactly right, God. You're right. Your judgments are true and they're righteous. Listen to me today. One of the most helpful things you'll ever do in your life is come to the place when you recognize God didn't do anything wrong to you. God never did anything wrong to you. I know individuals that think, well, you know what? God took my loved one. He's wrong. My friend, people die because they're sinners. And God gives every sinner the opportunity to have eternal life. Well, that's the fact of that scenario. You know, sometimes people think, well, this person died young. How could God let someone die young? What's the difference between dying young and dying old? When it comes right down to it, life's a vanity. It's a vapor, isn't it? You live 100 years or you live 10 years. What's the difference? We die because of sin. And God is not responsible for our sin. We are. Death comes because of our sin. You think you have a right to say, God, I'm angry at you because of this thing that happened in my life. My friend, Jesus died for you. And God offered you eternal life. And you're trying to hold on to a meager life, which is a vanity, which is a vapor. And you're not right to accuse God of that. God is right in everything He does. You know, there are individuals, I won't bow to God because of this scenario. I'll never forgive God for what happened to my father or my mother. I'll never forgive God for what that person did to me. My friend, that's the greatest bunch of nonsense. It's so illogical if you'll examine it fairly. To say that God is responsible for evil when God gave His Son to die on the cross for sinners. And here we see a witness in heaven saying, Even so, Lord. Okay, so what's the answer? What's the response? Well, God's never done wrong. These men have desired the blood of men. They've thirsted after the blood of the prophets. They're the ones who are wicked. God's righteous. Okay, now let's look at verse 8. Uh, in verse, the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed, the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give Him glory. Here we see number two. The number two reason why God is right is because these individuals are unrepentant. They're unrepentant. Um, what does it mean they're unrepentant? Well, repentance has a lot of context. Specifically here, these are wicked individuals. They have the mark of the beast on their foreheads. What does that mean? Well, it means they're Satan worshipers. They've aligned themselves with the enemy of God. And here they have had noisome sores, wounds, the waters have been turned to blood, and now the fire is scorching them, and their response is unrepentance. You say, well, pastor, why would anyone repent when God's doing that to you? Well, maybe to get His mercy. Maybe to seek His mercy. Hey, parents... Every child has a time when you have to when you have to break their will, don't they? It's just that there's a time for every child when uh, they you have to say you're not winning this one because if you don't, they'll be like these individuals and just be set rebels, set rebellious. Uh, I've been there a couple of times. You know they call it the terrible twos. I've been uh, with a lot of friends when their kids. It seems like it's when you have guests that your kids decide they're going to have their episode, mm -hmm. and I've been guest to a lot of episodes of two-year-olds when they just decide, I will not. Whatever it is mom or dad want me to do, I will not do it. And they understand what mom or dad want them to do and they've said, I'm not going to do it. And I've seen them go to great lengths and it's, you know, we've had some long like timeout periods like, you know, this took a couple hours before this kid found out mom and dad are the boss and you're going to have to bow your will to their will. Friend, <clears throat> some of us some of us didn't benefit by having those kind of parents that understood the importance of that. And so some of us don't even know when to call out for mercy. You know what mom and dad want for their kid to do? They don't want to keep spanking their child. They don't want to keep, you know, punishing their child. They want their child to do right. That's what they want. You know what mom and dad are wanting? They're wanting to be merciful. But they cannot be because 
of an unrepentant will, an unbending will. And here are individuals, and God's full wrath is poured out on them, and their response is cursing God. The response is to curse Him. Friend, I would just be honest with you, I don't have it in me. <laughs> I'm not a coward. I'm not a sissy. I'm not afraid of just about anything, to be quite honest with you. Not much scares me. But I'm telling you, I would bow the second any of these things started to happen to me. Because it's God. You're not going to win against God. You're not going to survive rebelling against God. This is God we're talking about here. And He's right to expect you to bow. Why should I have to bow to God? Well, good question. That's the second answer. Go back to chapter 4, will you, in Revelation? Chapter 4. This ought to be common sense, but I think sometimes we don't know it. Verse 10, this is when we're introduced to the four and twenty elders in heaven. The four and twenty elders fall down before Him and sat on the throne and worship Him and liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Notice the next statement. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Why should we have to bow to God? Because we belong to Him. And it is naturally the following logical conclusion that if God made us, He owns us. We don't like the idea of ownership very much. It just rankles us to think uh, we're so free-spirited that God Himself has the right to us. My friend, God made you and He has the right to you. God made you, He has the right to you. You want to support that with other Scripture, it's all over the, all over the Bible, but you could reference Colossians 1.16, Romans 4.11, or John 1.3, and you'd see that God has created us, and therefore He has right to expect us to worship Him. God created us, and He created us for His purpose, to worship Him. And if you won't bow to God, you are denying Him His right to be worshipped by His creation. God's right to expect to be worshipped. You hear me this morning? God's not some terrible villain that is you know, demanding and exacting and wants something from us that we cannot possibly deliver and wants us just to live in abject misery. No, God wants fellowship. God wants to bless us. God wants uh, to, be, to answer our prayers. You know, I want to tell you something, my friend. Not only does God made life, or not only has God given us eternal life, but He's given to us, if you ever read 2 Peter chapter 1, He's given us all the things that pertain to life and godliness. And so we can be partakers of His divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. God wants us to have a good life on this earth. I had sometimes Christians, well, when I get to heaven, I just look forward to, well, my friend, it's pretty good here. It's pretty good here. Uh, we live in bodies of sin. We realize that you know, we're constantly continually reminded that we're not long of this world. But the reality of it is God's good to us in this life. Amen. I can only testify of God's goodness. God's never done evil to me. Amen. God's been nothing but good. I can only testify of His goodness. Pastor, you never lost someone. You've never been through anything difficult. Oh, I've been through those things and I found God to be very good in those things. God's good. He's good. He's merciful and He's gracious. He's a wonderful, loving God. And it's His right for us to bow and to worship Him. That's, that's our uh, second reason why God is right to judge. Let's, let, let's read the rest of the chapter and we'll, we'll pick up some ancillary reasons. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. Notice verse 11, the, the, second, the, the, the last phrase, and repented not of their deeds. They were sorry about anything they're done, just angry at God for what he did in response. You know the law of thermodynamics, right? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. What causes God to judge the wicked? <laughs> Their rebellion, right? Their sin. And what causes God not to judge the wicked? Repentance. In other words, who's causing the action of God on, uh, for judgment here? Who has put themselves in this place? The wicked have. You feel sorry for them? I, I can't watch. 
you know? I, I, I don't know how many times <clears throat> siblings of mine got in trouble and I wasn't happy about it. I'm not happy about the wicked being judged, my friend, but the real reason is because I can identify with them. In other words, I have more in common with the wicked than I do with the righteous with one thing accepting, and that is that I've repented. And God doesn't look at me the same way. And I just think, why won't you repent? Why won't you repent? Why won't you turn? God's not asking you to be perfect. God's asking you to accept His perfect sacrifice and offering on your behalf, His Son. Is that so difficult? No, it's the simplest thing in the world. It's the easiest thing there is. I want to tell you something. The wicked here, I just have to say, they fully deserve everything they've gotten. Verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his file upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Here God is preparing a way for those that have the audacity to want to go up against him in battle. He's, he's preparing a road for them to travel along to come to him. <laughs> <laughs> and they're stupid enough to come. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. We know the dragon's the devil from chapter 9 and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. You see the irony here? You see the irony of the devil conspiring to get the kings of the world to go fight against God? Hey, let's go fight God. they be destroyed. And can I remind you, the devil's not your friend, never has been. Then in verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. If you were to read 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, you would see that for those that watch the day of the Lord, it's not going to be a mystery. It's going to come right on time. But for those that are wicked, it's going to be like a thief in the night that Jesus is going to come. And that's, that's what we have here. Verse 16, He that gathereth them together into a place, He gathered them together into a place called the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. This is that great place, a great battle. It really isn't a great battle, it's just destruction of the wicked. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. So we saw the great voice saying to the angels in verse 1 of chapter 16 saying, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And now we hear the voice saying, It's done. It's finished. You know, the first time Jesus said it's finished, the sins of the world, the sins of the world had been covered and paid for. And God's grace, which is so abundant and free, was freely offered. This time when the voice from heaven says it's done, the judgment of God on the wicked instead of on Jesus Christ. That is, those remaining. Let me ask you a question. Who in this crowd coming to meet God in the battle of Armageddon, who has to be here at this time in this position? Now, the first time Jesus said it is finished, <laughs> exempted them if they wanted to be. They don't have to be in this place, in this position. And so we see, if you want an auxiliary answer for do men deserve God's wrath and judgment? We see the simple response that it is always man's choice to put himself in the place of God's judgment. It's a choice of man's will to put himself in the place of God's judgment. Verse 18, There were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine and the fierceness of his wrath. We'll be introduced to Babylon next week. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men every uh, very great or great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. I'm, I'm told that's 70 to 90 pounds. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. In every instance where we see God's hand of judgment, we see man's fist and blasphemy and rebellion. And my question is, do men deserve God's judgment? Is God right and just and holy? Is He right to judge the wicked? The answer is yes. My friend, God survives this case. 
we put God to the test in court here today, and we look at this passage of Scripture, and we say these terrible things that God is going to do, and God's wrath and God's anger. Is He right? No, He's right. He's judging the wicked with blood because they love blood. They love to shed men's blood, and God's given them all of it that they can handle. Uh, is God right to, to, to judge men because they will not bow, because they will not repent, because they will not worship? And the answer is, God is worthy of worship. He created us for His pleasure. He created us to worship Him. And those that will not worship Him, my friend, are rebelling against their designer, against their design purpose. They think they belong to themselves, and they'll bow to themselves, but they won't bow to God. They'll bow to the Satan, but they won't bow to their Creator. And my friend, God's right to destroy the wicked. God prepares the way for the wicked of the earth to come to Him in judgment. And we're reminded from verse 17 when God says it is done that His Son said the same words on the cross, it is finished. The reality is no person has to be in this place because every person could have received His grace. And so when we see the great city divided into three parts in these hailstones, you know, our, our thought at this point is, why won't you bow? Well, because that's the way men are who will not receive God's mercy. There are people today that will not receive God's mercy. I'm always astonished at a person who understands the Gospel and yet refuses it. No one refuses the Gospel because they cannot believe there's a God who's right and righteous and judge. Everybody knows in their heart that they're created by God. That's a fact. And the day when they uh, fall before their Creator, the day of judgment, my friend, it's not a day of surprise to them. It's just a day of more rebellion, more of the same. And here we see these individuals, though they are suffering terribly in such a way that I feel, uh, I feel as though I, I wish I could plead for them. But what I would plead for them is, please bow. Please repent. And yet they will not repent. I can't help but think that it's possible that even in this place today, there would be those individuals that would know about God's love. My friend, God's your Creator. He is not out of line. He's not out of place expecting you to live for His purpose. To worship Him. And yet... You arch your backs and you face Him in heaven. You shake your fist and you say, No, God, it's my life. No, it's not your life. If it was your life, you'd have made yourself. But you didn't. God made you. And He made you for His purpose. And He's right to expect you to worship Him. And my friend, you're made to worship God. And so if you do it, you'd fulfill your purpose. You'd be happy. And you know, sometimes we think, Oh, I wouldn't be happy if I did what God wanted in my life. My friend, you'll never be happy any other way. That's what you're made for. That's what you're created for. You're so foolish to think that you can stand against God in heaven and survive rebelling against Him. I don't know what the thoughts in the minds of these individuals. I can only look at their actions and surmise. I can't tell you what a person is thinking when after the waters of the earth turn to blood, when after a noisome sore and grievous sore comes on them, when after a fire scorches them, when after hail weighing 75 to 90 pounds falls on them, they say, Curse you, God. I can't imagine what goes on in the mind of a person. I just know that it is rebellion to the extreme. And the last thing I think about that is I don't want any of that sort of attitude in me. None of it at all. I don't want, it. I don't want a little bit. I don't want any of it. I just want to fall before God and say, God, you're worthy to be worshipped. God, I want to know your mercy, not your judgment. My friend, there's a reason why men ought to fear God. I won't apologize for it. He's God. He's a Creator. And it isn't right for people not to worship Him, for men to rebel against Him. And God wins this case. There's no argument against God that says God is wrong to judge the wicked. There's every argument against the wicked which says God is doing what is not only His right, but that which ought to be done. Aren't you glad for God's mercy? Amen. Aren't you glad for God's mercy? Knowing the future, don't you, don't you see how important it is that we preach the Gospel and we preach the mercy of God, the long-suffering of God? I'm glad that I can tell people about the love of God. These people here don't know anything about it. There won't be any of it for them. It's too late. But my friend today, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God wants all men to be saved. And Romans 10 says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What an important message it ought to be for us to take home, knowing the future of the wicked. How, how vital ought it to be for us to respond to the mercy of God and to declare His mercy and His goodness as well as His judgment. You know, I have uh, before uh, read and been impressed by Jude in the letter, at the end of Jude's letter when he said, and if some have compassion, making a difference. And he says, others saved by fear, <laughs> pulling him out of the fire, hating even the garments that are spotted by the flesh. And you know, the gospel of fear is one that ought to be preached as well as the gospel of love. My friend, God loves you, uh, but God hates the wicked. And if you'll rebel against Him, God's wrath is going to be directed at you, and you won't have a good argument. And if you did, you wouldn't win anyway. He's God. That's a reality, and I think it's helpful for us to be faced, helpful for us to be faced by it, and to shape our thinking and our response. Would you would you preach the gospel with these truths in mind? Would you see the lost? Uh, would you see rebellion for what it is? Or just realize this is something that's deserving of God's wrath. Not your wrath. You got nothing to be angry about. Not your wrath, God's wrath. And you and your mercy ought to preach the wrath of God. Say, you know what? I'm not mad at you, but uh, if you don't bow to God, it's coming, and you deserve it. Father, thank you for what we've learned today, and I pray that you would just impress it. May it sober us. May it make us think of the severity, the severity of judgment. May it remind us as well of God, how merciful you are, but also may we be reminded of the, day, the age of grace that we live in and that your mercy is short-lived and that the day is going to come, that this is going to be the way that you're dealing with all the wicked. Remind us of these things and press us by them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.